and welcome to our wonderful Friday afternoon at the Manners Speaker Series. And this is every week is a wonderful intrigue of uh, people coming from many different corners. And uh, now Susan Johnson will be introducing people, but this is a quick overview. We have what's happening at the Roehampton Shelter at Christmas, and also Cabin Boy Knits with Christopher Walker. And over to you, Susan, who's our, uh, she, she helps navigate, keep our sanity going. And it was Susan's idea that we do this. So wisdom comes in, in, in her thought, heart, mind, and spirit. Over to you, Susan. Oh, yeah, no pressure. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with Eartha Downey, who is the project uh, manager, program supervisor at the Roehampton Shelters, which has been in the news for the last several months. And um, some very positive things are happening, and she'll give us some in insight into what's going on and how things are being handled. So I thought and, and, and just to add that we also have Nicole Williams. I'm not sure where the sound is coming from, but if, if you're not speaking, if everyone can mute, that'd be wonderful. And then we can have time for Q&A in between, uh, also Eartha and Nicole and, and, and Christopher. Okay, thank you. Okay, did you want me to start? Oh, uh, one second, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Oops. Sorry, is everybody able to hear me? Oh, Just we can hear you loud and clear. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Yes. Um, so I'm the program supervisor at the Roehampton residence. We have currently um, operating with 150 co ed residents that reside at the shelter right now. Um, we opened as a, um, as a response to needing to physical distance in the shelter system to make sure that our clients were remaining as safe as possible. We um, have been in the community, I guess, since about late July, and we will be here for probably about another 18 months or so. Um, On-site supports that we have, we have nursing supports and medical supports from inner city health associates. Um, we have an MDOT team that works with people with complex mental health and trauma. We have NAME Res on site to provide services and supports for our residents that identify as First Nations. In addition, we have counselors that are working on case plans and housing plans with our residents to ensure that they are getting housed in the community as quickly as possible. We also have employment specialists on site as well as we will have um, telecounselors working through OW to be able to support our clients as well. Um, we're a shelter that operates uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have a full dietary team that provides three healthy meals with vegetarian options as well um, and a snack to all of our clients. Now, I don't know if there are people who have questions um, about some of the supports and some of the programming that we have here, but Nicole and I are able to answer any of those questions for you. Do people have any questions before we plunge in further? Just you can put your hand up or you can, uh, Nicole's having a bit of a challenge getting in and out. So, so or maybe she has calls to just deal with. What you might wanna do is just simply put your hand up where you are and they could ask a question directly of, of Eartha. No questions at this point. Well, Ruth, I mean, one question I may have is: I think you were you were telling me that people arrive in the shelter, and then the the aim is to transition people out into their own permanent sense of, of housing. And, yes. And, and uh, so then, I think you said there's an average of what five people per week is per it? month that per we month. are getting okay. housed right now. We expect that number to rise um, as we have more supports on site. Um, the housing market in Toronto is not really, it's not accessible to a lot of the clients that we work with. So the counselors work very diligently to create partnerships and relationships with landlords in the community, as well as filling out the housing application forms for community housing for clients. But it is very challenging, um, especially during a pandemic. But even without that, the rents are very high in Toronto. The supports that people need tend to be centralized. So people are needing to be housed in more central locations, which 
means obviously higher rent. So um, in, in many ways, it's, it's, it's a challenge to find housing for our clients, but the councillors work very hard at making that happen. Well, thank you. And so then, uh, and I think you mentioned before that we, we, we've been donating hampers that had household products uh, for people, meaning kitchen, kitchen utensils, as well as linens and towels. And but the the need will continue in the new year. I'm assuming. Yes, when clients move out, we do have um, we do have access to items from the furniture bank for our clients. Um, and but when they move out, they are still needing those startup supplies. So it makes it a lot more homey and warm feeling to have people be able to set up their kitchen, make their bed with linen. So it just makes it that much more comfortable for people who have been living in shelters or outside for long periods of time. Nicole's uh, trying to get back in. I think she's might be back in now. Are you back in, Nicole? Yes. Hello. I had to mute my device because my laptop is not letting me join. I apologize. Okay, no problem. You might want to speak a bit closer, turn up your volume. Can you hear me? It's a bit faint. I'm going to try to fix my audio. I really apologize. No problem. We're all, we're all dealing in a technological challenge in, in, in many corners and many shapes. Okay. Yeah, so, so Eartha, when you think of uh, the shelter at Christmas time, I mean, keeping in mind people come from many faith traditions. So, so are people honoring, um, I would say, Christmas, Hanukkah, Diwali, and uh, maybe other traditions altogether? Any, is, is it, what, what's happening in that department? That's exactly how we do our holidays in December. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we try to do um, meals and information um, on all of the holidays throughout the year. December um, tends to focus around uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa because those are the ones that happen directly in December. But we do honor all of the holidays throughout the year with meals and information. So we started working on the lighting of the menorah last night. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to have a holiday dinner on the 16th, which is an inclusive dinner um, that is going to incorporate all three of the holidays that are happening in December. Um, but in addition, we will pull in some of the items from Diwali as well, because Diwali was quite close to Christmas this year. Um, on the 24th, we are having a Christmas Eve with snacks and eggnog and hot chocolate, um, jelly donuts and Christmas cookies. And then on the 25th, we're going to do a, a Christmas lunch and a Christmas breakfast this allows the dietary team to be home in the evening to have dinner with their families as well. Um, and then on December 30th, we're going to be celebrating Kwanzaa, which starts on the 26th of December and ends on the 31st. And then on the 31st, we're going to celebrate New Year's Eve with hot chocolate and, and a whole lot of um, items and events going on in the evening to celebrate. Remind that maybe some people aren't as familiar with Kwanzaa, what, what, how, you, how you will mark Kwanzaa what, and what the significance is for people. So Kwanzaa is a, um, was started as an African-American holiday in the 70s in California. We now have begun celebrating it in Toronto, I would say probably for about the last 20 years or so, in the last five, much more so. It's, um, it's a harvest celebration that celebrates the harvest and celebrates different themes on each day. So it's a seven day celebration, each day meaning something different from unity to um, self-determination. There's days on creativity. So each day is marked with a different theme for the family. There aren't any gifts typically given at Kwanzaa. Things become commercial. And so there are commercialized gifts for Kwanzaa now, but Kwanzaa gifts tend to be handmade and only for children. And Kwanzaa, a gift for the family, typically happens once when you put in like basically spare money throughout the year and then you buy a gift for the family. So if the toaster broke, that gift would be a toaster for the family. So it's not, it's not considered to be a commercial holiday, but it's becoming more and more commercial. Oh, great. Marianne, did you have a, 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 were you clapping or did you have your hand up? 
I didn't know how to put my hand up, so I clapped instead. Okay, good. Okay, well, Marion probably has a question. Yes. Yeah, I just uh, a few things. One is um, we recently received um, a biography that a resident um, at Roehampton had written, and it was uh, just wonderful. I hope that we get more. It's so uh, it was so great to get to know a resident um, and hear their story. And so we've posted it on our church website and, and really feel like it's a great way for the community to get to know the residents. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. And my question was, um, there are a lot of people out there who want to support the shelter. Is there any, are there any other ways other than the welcome baskets that you feel that the church or the community could support the shelter? There's an ongoing need for donations of toiletries, unused socks and underwear for both men and women, as well as gloves for the, for the holidays. Our clients do um, from time to time lose their gloves and it can get very cold um, in the months of January and February. So gloves are always very handy to have. And that would include handmade mittens? mittens? Absolutely. Okay, great. great. And, and and then handmade because my friend Edna she's I think I told her she's 95 and she you know, she knits like a like a factory and she I think she has a couple hundred more um, uh, hats and and uh, toques and, and and scarves and whatnot to uh, come and uh, but she says wool is becoming a premium it's hard to find wool and uh, it's quite something yeah. yeah well probably a lot of people have taken up uh, knitting, knitting during yes, the uh, pandemic because it's something that people can feel purposeful to do. That, that and bread making, there was a run on flour months ago and, and, and cookie baking. And uh, yeah, we've been making, we have about over 50 dozen we made at home uh, in the last month or so for different places. Yeah, and uh, now Nicole, you're back on. Can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Oh, great, okay. <laughs> I cannot get my video to work. Um, it just keeps freezing and kicking okay. me out. So I, I sincerely apologize. No problem. It's, it's, it's probably a bandwidth thing. Yes. I think so. I think so. The, the, the joy of technology. Okay. But I'm, oh. I'm listening and I hear Eartha is describing everything so well. And uh, thanks, Eartha. <laughs> and I want to just thank everybody for everything that they are already doing, um, like the hampers, um, like the knitting um, of the hats and uh, scarves. Honestly, we could, you know, if there's hundreds, uh, they, they will be well utilized. So um, we sincerely appreciate everybody's uh, commitment and generosity. It's, it's wonderful and we appreciate you. Wonderful. Now I'm, I'm just thinking of like, as you mentioned food. So where, where does the food come from? that is used for the program? Is that purchased with, with budget or is that donations or? Uh, it is uh, fully funded um, by us. Um, so we have contracts for food um, and we have a full dietary services team that then purchases um, according to that contract. Um, and uh, then we have a chef who plans all the meals um, along with the dietary supervisor. Uh, we do not uh, utilize donations for meals. Um, any donations, the shelter standards say, would have to be supplemental to the food program. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Now, in, in terms of uh, people, people at the shelter, is there, uh, well, we mentioned about uh, some donations at this time. Is there any? I mean, I did send links to. I mean, you can even send you for Sunday morning, but is there other programs people would like to be connecting to in the community? Yeah, um, I, th I think everybody's looking for something. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so I apologize if there's feedback. Um, everybody is looking for engagement at this time and just how we do it safely is, is another story, right? Mm. Um, but every time, and the, we've gotten generous donations of art supplies, um, also from, um, uh, the community um, from the church, like through, the, through your church. Um, so we had a night where clients made um, ornaments um, that were donated, so handmade ornaments. Um, and we, it's great to have these things on site, but just like all of us, we kind of want to go a bit 
outside of our, <laughs> our little um, home base um, and engage in, in our general community. So absolutely, it's just, I think everybody's struggling with how is that done safely during COVID. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it's interesting because I, I know I see children gathering in the park beside the church and I, and I know there's other parks, but is there any place where, I mean, anyone I mean, other than children and parents are gathering, I guess not so much. What, what's, your, yeah. what's your sense of that? Yeah, I, I find that sometimes our clients will gather um, outside together in, mm. in a way that they could, you know, speak to each other. That's always when it's outdoors. Indoors, we limit it as much as possible. Um, and we have limits on every space and we have everything set up where you sit in a physically distanced way. But I think our clients have, do a good job in finding ways to engage with each other. Um, you know, when you, even if it's just a chat, um, you know, sitting in the dining room, uh, we had movie night um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so people find ways to gather, but as the weather gets colder, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. But today, for example, would be a fantastic day to hold something outdoors. Yes, but it's hard to plan. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And then how do you know, right? The weather in Canada. <laughs> and then I guess the idea is that any outdoor gathering, you're limited to 10 people anyways, right? So that's right. Yes. Yeah. So I keep, keep an eye on that as well. Definitely. That's right. Definitely. Now, I should share with you. So, a, a person I know who is connected to the Seeds of Hope, I believe it's called, or Faith, no, Faith in the Common Good. Uh, she had an idea of, of, of using church parking lots for, for tents. And I thought, you know, that I, I can't imagine that would really fly with some people, but I mean, I'm glad to hear you're doing what you're doing. And, uh, but because there, there are, is there, it, because winter's coming and there's a lot of people out there on the streets or on, on the, um, or sleeping rough, as we call it. And is there is there is this need greater than any other winter before? Are you talking about uh, people who are sleeping outdoors? Than you? Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, this year, I think there are currently almost 500 people sleeping outdoors that they've counted. Um, right. and, well, no encampments, and then number of people could be. Close, approaching a thousand um they we've never seen anything like this before it's tough though um you know the city has a whole unit dedicated to that um and it's a multi-divisional approach as well because um parks and recs are involved in transportation um what we see sometimes is that when we you know, health and safety is number one. And so, for example, you want to make sure people have access to everything that they need to be safe. But we also don't want to give people a false sense of security to sleep outside. Um, and it's a matter of trying, the goal of the city is to try to get people inside, right? Um, but uh, you just reminded me when you said tents at a church um, in Prince Edward County, um, the United Church there. I was there for um, something and they had an outdoor um, parking lot thing where they had tents set up mm -hmm. and people were limited and would go to each tent. So people are becoming creative during this time. Um, and I think it's, you know, everybody has been, it's about everybody having fantastic ideas. How do we, you know, then roll them out? Mm -hmm. And to make it work for everybody to be exactly. safe, safe and, and happy. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Good. Good. The hope is that people who are sleeping outside will come indoors, right? That's that's really the hope. Um, the city is opening up more spaces, um, and I I would rather see people sleeping indoors. Um, and I hope that the city and and groups. Um, will come together to find a way to get people inside. And now the, uh, the existing shelters are, are people, are, are, have they reduced the numbers that people can sleep in the shelters? Is, is that one of the challenges or? Yes, and that's why there's so many more. Um, oh, that's, okay, right. And that's why there's Roehampton and uh, there has to be two meters of space between everybody staying in a shelter. And right. in some places that just wasn't possible. And so they're 
the numbers reduced and uh, more spaces are open in other locations. So I see Susan Johnson wants to ask a question. Okay, Susan, do you want to ask a question? And actually, go ahead. Yeah, okay, it's Andy Ann. right here. I'm sharing with Susan here. We had lunch together. Um, I was actually really surprised. Um, I was downtown uh, yesterday and I couldn't believe how many tents were set up in the parks downtown. I'm wondering if with COVID, because our shelter system has been poor, shall we say, at best, even though we, you know, try to have a great shelter system, it, it hasn't been great. And and I'm feeling that probably the um, the people who are in those tents are feeling much safer there than in what they would know as a shelter system from years past how crowded they are, how everybody's in together. I know that that is not the case now, but how do we get, how do we get that message out to people that there are shelters that are not, that is in their brain already? That, that's an excellent question. And I think that's what Streets to Homes struggles with um, often. Um, it's, you know, trying to present this uh, space to someone and trying to encourage them and know, let them know that, where they're going is a, is a safe place. Um, so yes, absolutely, the shelter system could do better. But the mandate also is that we want to see every Torontonian in in housing. So I know that our division is very much trying to do that and focus in that direction. And how do we get people housed? I I think that. Places like Roehampton made people feel a bit safer to come inside, and um, it's become um, a, a space that is trusted now in general amongst a lot of people sleeping outside. But there's not endless amounts of hotel rooms um, that we can access for people. So it's a huge part of the work for Streets to Homes um, to convince people that where they're going to refer them to is a safe place. I think that the city is trying to put out information to help people understand that new spaces are um, being set up to be uh, safe, socially distanced, and in general, um, a better alternative to sleeping outside. Well, thank you for answering that. That's very helpful. And uh, I guess the key part is to encourage, 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 right? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's about building trust. I think that, um, you know, some of the people that have stayed uh, at Roehampton is it may have been skeptical at first and it was about building trust and there's when um, workers come to see some of the people they've known to uh, sleep outdoors they said uh, they haven't seen people look this good since they met them um, you know a decade before um, so that actually brought tears to my eyes in the sense that you know they've they accepted uh, an indoor space um, and they actually are doing so much better than they were before. And I wish somehow that word would spread amongst people who are staying outdoors. Is there another shelter being worked on that's sort of similar to Roehampton? Like they're trying to find other places. And the reason I'm asking that is I know that when Roehampton was first going in, there was a lot of pushback from some of the community that, you know, not in my backyard kind of attitude. I think the church, our church and, and the church of the community have worked really hard to change that mentality. Um, so I'm mean, if there's maybe something that, yeah, I don't know, that we could be doing to encourage other neighborhoods to take on a shelter situation like, like we have at Wilhelmton. Oh, for sure. Um, so we are one of, I think, 18 hotels. So we're not limited um, to being, like we're not that unique. We, we're unique in the sense that um, we set up um, as a city program. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I don't know, Eartha, if you're on mute, if you could if go other on. People, well, I think everyone's muted pretty well, except me. Okay. Me... okay. Um, so there's 
um, I think it's 18 other hotels that were used during the course of the time. Um, and some people um, uh, prefer places over others. Like we have uh, Scarborough locations. Um, some people didn't want to initially go to Scarborough and then felt good in Scarborough um, and stayed. Others won't even go in the first place. Um, downtown hotels, um, filled up pretty quickly right in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so those spaces are limited as well. Um, and there were a few that were opened up um, uh, throughout the pandemic and they've been uh, utilized. And um, we did have similar things that happened in, in uh, our area, in other areas. Um, and a lot of engagement is happening there with, with those areas. Some places already had shelter. Um, they're used to shelter and, um, you know, they accepted and, and welcomed the shelter. Um, but I'm not sure how much capacity the city has to open even more. Um, although we have seen um, the ones that are in, um, I guess, Toronto closer to the core uh, being pretty successful for, for getting people inside. It's interesting. I, I where I run in the morning, I, I run by a shelter. Well, it, it was a gym, and so now I think you said you said you were there's about 17 hotels that were turned into shelters, right? Yes, and uh, Roehampton's not one of them, but um, I know that the city in general is looking at existing buildings that we had, and right. any hotels that aren't expected to. You know, the owners are like, you know, they're. Um, I can't utilize this space anymore. Um, and may um, be converted to housing. Um, so that's in a bigger strategic plan. Um, Roehampton isn't one of them, but other locations may be. And I think um, hopefully we'll see some of the spaces that we created um, become uh, permanent housing for people. Well, I would imagine to your point, there's a lot of hotels that won't reopen. I mean, at this point, right? Because they can't, right? That's right. Um, many, you know, may have been at the end of their, you know, they were already struggling. Um, and then this would have been it um, for them. So in cases like that, um, you know, it would be people are already inside. Um, people need housing. Um, the, the owners of those spaces um, need uh, financial assistance. Um, so it might be a, a, a way to um, uh, create more uh, space in Toronto. So do people have more questions of, of Eartha and uh, Nicole? Susan, Betty, or, or Gerald, or anybody? One more thing, because we did talk um, how with some of um, comments about going downtown and, and seeing so many encampment, encampments, and it's true, um, I have not seen this many encampments um, in our city um, and I've, I've been doing this for 17 years um, so it, even in, in places we've never seen them before so that stretches um, streets to homes resources as well because they're used to working in certain areas because people would generally stay in certain areas um, but now for the first time we're seeing encampments all across the city of Toronto everywhere it's a it's a very unique situation. Yeah, I remember even seeing in the GTA encampments, which is not not usual. Definitely, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, I, people I, I, were already living in precarious housing before this, and uh, we don't have any teeth if you're not if you don't have a proper lease, and you're just you know maybe sleeping on someone's couch, and then they don't want you there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what do you do next? And there's a variety of reasons why people sleep outside, but um, yeah, it, it, it's a unique situation that we have in our city currently, for sure. Okay, Jill, okay. Jill's one of our members who attends the meetings as well. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Jill. Hello. Hello there. Hello. So, so were you, I think you've met um, Nicole is, is on the call and so is Eartha. And uh, we've been hearing wonderful insights of what's happening at the shelter and people have been, oh, asking great. People have been asking questions. So did you have any questions you wanted to ask of Nicole or Eartha? Uh, 
<laughs> uh, sorry, I'm late coming in. Um, I just read Edward's awesome story that you shared with us that we're going to share with our churches on Sunday. So thank you for sending that. Yes, no, thank you for sharing. Uh, he's so excited to share his story. Um, and it's, it, it is uh, heartwarming. And um, he, I see that he wants to kind of spread the word to make sure people understand who is in the shelter system and and make sure that um you know people understand um not to always label someone with a stigma this the stigma and and uh, stereotype and um he's very excited to share his story and um i'm sure we could have we have others it's just sometimes tough to get people to uh, sit down and write it <laughs> write it together but with Edward want, writing it himself and eager and coming to us it was it was an easy way to to spread his story so I hope um, you find it um, as heartwarming as we did that's for sure very much so so thank you to him for sharing it and for you to making that happen and yes we'd love to hear more uh, more stories when and if they're available and people are willing to share those I think we can learn so much and I think Absolutely. as you mentioned it's not it's to kind of not hold those stereotypes that we have exactly exactly and some of someone came in uh, 416-656-0798 well welcome did you want to just unmute and say your name or, or not maybe not they just want to listen okay sometimes they can't hear too well okay and uh, sorry sorry nicole you were going to say something else no no i was just in agreeance and i as we could get stories to you and any in people engaged, you know, I know you've had connections with um, at least one of our residents. So um, that direct even uh, conversation um, between the church and our, our, our residents, um, I, I think is so very useful. Wonderful. And we'll, we'll, we'll continue to reach out and see how we can uh, be, a, be, a, be of service, especially as, as the, the, the days will get colder uh, ahead. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I well, thank you, uh, Nicole. And one more Mara. question. One more question, and you have a question. Okay. Um, I was just thinking about getting stories from people. When my mom was at Bridgepoint, um, they had a volunteer that um, came around and kind of interviewed the residents to try to kind of get a story from them, um, because you know a lot of have great stories, but they don't know how to make, get it down on paper or record it or, or somehow, you know, put it onto some sort of uh, medium that can be shared with other people. And so I wondered if, I know COVID makes it a little more difficult, but I wondered if there might be someone that, you know, could, could go in and interview some of the people at the shelter and get some of their stories. I didn't know if that would be a yeah. thing. You, we actually, it's it. We actually have that planned um, through our community liaison committee, um, and uh, she is a retired teacher, and uh, she is going to be doing that in a virtual way. And I, I think that we can link that so that it not only does she collect it, but she could share it um, amongst, um, you know, all the community groups. So it's, it's hopefully it'll get started really soon, but it's on our agenda for sure. Wonderful. I remember seeing that in one of the conversations. Yeah, it's part of the journey of up learning and discovering together. Okay. Now, any more questions? Well, Nicole and, uh, and Ertha, thank you and for, for being part of this. And you're more than welcome to stay on in here as we just slide forward to hearing from our next speaker, but it's been a, a very inspiring and, and I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad and delighted that one that you're, you're helping people and, and together uh, we as a community are, are reaching out to each other. I remember it was Tommy Douglas who said, unless a community reaches out for the most vulnerable, then they're, I'm, I'm not remembering correctly, but we're, we're missing what we need to be about. And the idea of we're all in this together. And he was speaking to a time uh, when Canada was going through its own uh, very, very uh, stretched resources time. And so, but he was uh, certainly a leader that we can certainly learn from again today. Definitely. So th no, thank thank you. you so very much for having us and thank you for being connected with us. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Susan, you want to uh, now introduce our next. Uh, speaker, uh, Christopher Walker. 
Uh, yes, uh, from Cabin Boy Knits, and I was looking at your, your background and going, ooh. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Excellent, thank you. Um, I just want to thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I always have a, love the opportunity to talk about yarn and wool and Cabin Boy Knits and yarn dyeing. Um, so again, I just wanted to, to thank you for extending the invitation to have me come and speak. Um, I do want to mention that if, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, love answering your questions. And um, if it's interactive, it, it'd be great. I might have some questions for you as well. Um, so just to get going, I just want to share some context around, um, you know, if I give you a little bit about my bio um, and who I am, and that will form a context around, you know, the story of Cabin Boy Knits and, and how I got to where I am. But I think just briefly, um, I design knitwear, I dye um, yarn naturally using a lot of the um, botanicals that I use for dyeing my yarn come from my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I'm located, I live in a log cabin in Sterling, Ontario. And so that if you think about Belleville or Trenton, I'm just north of, the, north of that. Um, the log cabin I live in is from the 1850s. And it's actually two log cabins that were taken apart. One was from Renfrew County, another one was from, um, yeah, both of them were from Renfrew County. And they were taken apart and then rebuilt on this property in the 70s. And so I'm lucky to be, to be living in this spot right now. And it's on 17 acres and it's in the uh, Oak Hills. So I've got tons of oak trees around me, which is a great resource for, for dyeing yarn. Uh, I've got, I teach all over the world. I've taught in Europe and uh, throughout North America. I teach knitting and I also teach um, yarn dyeing as well. And um, I have clients all over the world. Uh, I've dyed for, dyed yarn for museums. Um, and I, I would say teaching is definitely one of the passions so I, I, that I get uh, out of this. So I've had a, um, I really enjoying this part of my life and um, the story, or I guess that Kevin, or the road that Kevin Boy Knits is leading me to. I think when I, you know, when I talk about people ask, you know, when, when did you start knitting? Um, the, I think the seed was planted when I was a little boy and my grandmother would knit and she was an avid knitter. Um, and a, we would go up to Bob Cajun, that's where my grandmother lived, um, an hour, two hours, two and a half hours away from Toronto. And so on Saturday nights, I would just hear the clicking of needles and, and it was a soothing sound. It was, it was uh, wonderful. And so, you know, boys back then weren't encouraged to knit. And I know I definitely lived in a house where it wouldn't be encouraged to, to take up knitting. So I didn't pursue that. Um, it wasn't until I was an adult and I was attending a business meeting in Boston and we were sitting around a table of, of, of friends and someone mentioned to me, to that an individual keeps angora rabbits in his garage. And so that would lead, the, lead you to the question, well, why does he do that? And it's to take the hair from the angora rabbit, spin it. And then the follow-up question is, well, why does he spin it? And it's to knit. So I thought, well, if there's, not, if there's a guy sitting here who's a knitter um, and he enjoys it, you know, why can't I do that? And so really I picked up knitting um, as an adult and it was really a, a way for me to unwind. I have a pretty stressful uh, full-time job. And so this was really a way for me to escape. And also as I got better as a knitter, um, I could have an influence on, on what I was knitting and inject my creativity. Um, so I really, really um, started to enjoy it. But I kind of felt like I was the only person doing this. I didn't see a lot of male knitters out there. And so, I went onto the internet and started searching for male knitters. Are there other guys out there who are, who are knitting? And I happened upon a um, website and it was a retreat for men who knit. And I thought, wow, who would ever think of something like that? So, and it was in upstate New York, uh, Saratoga Springs. And so um, I thought, well, I'm gonna sign up and, and see what this is all about. And I was really nervous. I was, cause I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I, there was no reason for me to be nervous because when I got there, there were 40 guys, um, who were attending the retreat and they were all at different levels. They, we had some of the 
greatest knitters in um, the United States to you know beginners, and it, it was incredible. It was uh, there were workshops there for for everyone. Um, the people who taught the workshops were just volunteers, so they were so we basically got free classes from some of the best teachers in in the United States. Um, but everybody was so supportive, and I just definitely felt that I found found my tribe when I was there because you know everybody was just so helpful and. Um, we shared a common interest, and so that just ignited an, in, something inside of me, and you know, really um, started the passion that I had. It, there were so many feelings that came out of that, you know, the creative aspect of it. Um, I wanted to know where this could take me, um, so it was it was really exciting. I think that was a pivotal moment. I think the other um, seed that was planted that weekend was um, there was a, a table at the at the retreat, and the table was full of yarn. And so people would bring their yarn and then uh, we would buy it and the money would go towards sponsoring um, and it, uh, basically anyone who couldn't afford to go to the retreat. So basically we had scholarship scholarships for, for people who couldn't afford to, to go. And this was a way of raising funds. But there was some yarn sitting there and I, it was absolutely beautiful. And the guy who, there was a guy standing behind it and he said, well, this is yarn that I dyed. And I just thought, my gosh, I can't believe that. Um, somebody created this because you don't, if you, when you're not, um, I guess when you're not an experienced knitter, you're not really looking for where, where's the yarn coming from, who's dying it, it just comes, it just arrives in the store. And it's probably dyed by, you know, a large company. But it was, I was so inspired by what he was able to create that I thought, you know, this is, I have to try this. I want to try this. I, I love it. It looks um, beautiful. And what a wonderful thing to create. So I decided that I would um, venture down that road. And I wasn't sure whether or not I would use what 99% of the population is using acid dyes to, to dye the yarn, or if I would um, go down the natural route. And most of the practices that I have are focused on sustainability. So it didn't make a lot of sense for me to go down the acid dye route. I wanted to see what I could do with natural dyes. And specifically, if there was, you know, what, could, what colors can I get out of the, um, out of the plants, out of the botanicals that are around my area. And what it did was a number of things. It, there was a fantastic connection between myself and nature. And I have, I have two kids. Both of my kids are um, significant, uh, or have a huge interest in science. And so uh, I was never, science was never an area that I necessarily gravitated towards. Uh, but what it did do was by, by starting to venture out and forage for botanicals um, really gave me an appreciation for, for, for nature. And um, you know, I, when I go for walks now, it's a completely different experience. I look up in the trees for oak gulls or I look down on the ground for acorns. Um, it's, it's just a completely different experience. When I see goldenrod in the ditches, you know, that's a, a, a friend for me. That's something that I want to go and harvest or sumac off of the stags or sumac trees. So I completely changed my perspective. And it also, you know, gave me another, um, I guess, uh, conversation with my daughter, especially, who's, who's very much an environmentalist and focused on the, our ecosystem. I refer to her a lot when I'm looking for expertise, but it's, um, it's a great conversation that we have together. So it really has brought me a lot more than um, just the, the dying aspect of it. But so I started going down that road and, and, and dyeing yarn. Um, I was knitting, my knitting was accelerating. And um, I noticed that in the knitting world, um, I would say, and this based on my interaction, probably 90%, at least 90% of males, I fall within the LGBTQ community. And so um, I thought it was interesting because there was definitely a perspective um, of what a male knitter was. And I think it was largely associated with um, some of the big names in knitting. Um, and th if there was one stereotype, so there was one stereotype of what a male knitter was. And I thought, you know, this is kind of ridiculous. When you look at um, all of the, the male knitters that are out there, you know, you've got all kinds of different backgrounds. You've got different professional backgrounds, different um, racial backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, and really there isn't a, a lens on this at all. And so I was thinking, you know, there's an opportunity here 
to, to bring a different lens to, to the knitting community and to show that there are all different types of um, male knitters out here uh, with all different types of backgrounds. And so I created kind of the, the polar opposite of what the current image was um, of a male knitter. And um, that's how Cabin Boy Knits was born. It was really, you know, what if I create a, a lumberjack who lives in a, in a log cabin and, and knits? And so how would people react to that? And so, um, and the answer was quite favorably. So it was, it was a good thing. But what it did was my point was really to emphasize or to pro provide a different perspective on, on male knitting. Um, and uh, I think that's, you know, that, that, was the, that was the impetus of it. Um, there's also, you know, knitting allowed me to get back into the arts. And I was, uh, when I was a teenager, before I went off to university, I was heavily focused in the arts. Um, and in fashion. And so I was able to um, get back into, in, into art galleries um, or fashion shows. And, and it was all through uh, the creative process of, of knitting. Um, so it was really, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible what this, how this has morphed um, into something bigger than I um, had expected. But when I, when I look at um, any of the art that I create or um, a lot of the patterns that I design, um, I'm, I'm there to tell a story. And I'm really there to talk about um, masculine, feminine uh, perspective on, on something. Or I'd, I'd want to bring in, you know, it's, uh, when you're looking at a hat, there's a story behind the hat. Um, for example, I've got a hat here that I just um, created as a design for. And mm -hmm. I use, I call this um, pattern, Winter Kept Us Warm. And so Winter Kept Us Warm is a movie, actually. It's a movie um, that was shown at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it was the first um, gay movie in English that was, shot at, that was shown at the Cannes Film Festival. And I thought, you know, this is perfect because the movie, you can watch it on YouTube, but there's a scene in the movie. And when you think about Canada and you think about the winter, it, it, it per perfectly encapsulates that, um, that moment. And so I thought, you know, I've got a global audience. Um, I wanna bring exposure to you know, Canada and this is a way to do it. And so um, I called it Winter Kept Us Warm. And I, I, I do refer in the pattern to the segment in the movie where there's a snowball fight. It takes place um, in the middle of uh, the court at um, University of Toronto. And it's just, I, I, it's, it's just a wonderful piece of of Canadiana. And, and so Cabin Boy Knits really, uh, I guess the other primary focus is to focus on Canada and, and bring Canada to the world to talk about um, Canadian wool. I, I focus primarily on Canadian wool. I do dye with other fibers from, from other parts of the world and I'll get into the reasons for that in a minute. Um, really it's to promote can the Canadian wool industry. Um, I'm a huge advocate of promoting other dyers in Canada. So oftentimes um, we'll, I'll collaborate either with Canadian designers or with other dyers on, on various projects. But it's really um, you know, an opportunity for me to, to showcase Canada. Um, you know, I was teaching a class once on the Voyager Touque. And so there was a festival and the festival was all about uh, promoting Canada in, in certain aspects. And it was around telling stories. So there were plays, there was all kinds of different types of arts in it. And I taught a knitting class and the knitting class was, I, I thought I will teach how to knit a Voyager toque. And then I'll also take the opportunity to tell the story of the Voyagers as, as we knit. And so uh, I thought it was, a, I thought it was a, a great class. When I walked into the class, I would say that um, the average, I always ask my students how long they've been knitting, just to give me a perspective. And I think the, the average is probably around 40 years. And so, and then one person in the class said that they wrote a master's, their, their master's thesis on the Voyagers. And so I thought, oh my gosh, what, what do I have to possibly offer this class? <laughs> We've got somebody who's an expert. So if I say anything that's inaccurate about the Voyagers, <laughs> She'll definitely um, be able to correct me. And also, um, you know, these knitters have been knitting for, for a long time. 
what is it that they can learn from me? And what I found out was that um, it's been my experience working with knitters, a lot of knitters, that we get, we find our comfort zone and we love to stick to, you know, the same type of cast on or the same type of cast off. And so I guess what I was able to bring to the class was just a, a couple of tricks that I learned in terms of casting on to make it easier or hiding your floats, um, which are basically just the inside of the hat when you flip it inside. You, know, you want to make sure that these this part is tucked in tightly so it doesn't catch on and, and rip. Um, and so there were, I, 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 it was it was an interesting class because I didn't think that it was possible for me to teach them anything. But um, you know, it is one thing when we uh, we do we are a creature of habit and we fall into to to certain things. I'm I'm guilty of that myself. Um, but the teaching part of it is is really important to me. I give um, lectures on the history of knitting in Canada because I find that fascinating. Um, I'm also a huge advocate of, of Canadian wool and. Um, I actually, you know, I think the, the, the point in time where I developed that interest was uh, a number of years ago, I was hosting a, um, I called it an international tea. And we had people from magazines and designers and um, farmers and um, dyers all under one roof, all, all at my cabin. And it was really, I just wanted to get this group together so that they would talk because how often does a designer talk to the sheep farmer? And so I wanted to, to bring that everybody together. And halfway through the party, a farmer came up to me and she said, um, I don't believe this, but these people have no idea where their wool comes from. And I just said, how is that possible? How is it possible that a famous designer who works exclusively in wool has no idea where her yarn comes from or how it's processed. And so um, I started to ask myself that question. Well, do you know where your yarn's coming from? Do you know how it's processed? Um, do you know how it's dyed? And so, you know, it really took me down this hole and I wanted to find out you know, where it's coming from. You know, is it coming from Canada? Is it coming from other countries? You know, was it coming from a farm? What type of breed of sheep is it? Uh, because it, you're not gonna get a, a lot of the information on a, on a yarn label. And so I started going down that hole and then it led me to Upper Canada Fiber Shed. And the Upper Canada Fiber Shed is an organization that is, if you were to draw a circle around um, Toronto, it's about circumference of 700 kilometers. And the objective is really to get farmers together and um, alpaca and, and sheep farmers together and um, develop, connect them to knitters and dyers and spinners and weavers so that there's a market that is that is developed for these farmers. Because a lot of the wool, 90% of our wool goes to China for processing and it ends up as um, as carpets or, or um, insulation or, or other things. And so, um, you know, there's, there's other aspects of it. A lot of farmers just don't even take it to a mill to be processed because it's, they, they just don't get enough money from the processing of it. So uh, they just leave it in the fields, and, which is a shame because there's so much you can do with, uh, with this wool. And so I really wanted to find out, you know, how do I connect the dots? How do I get, a, how do I identify the farms? How do I connect with the farms? How do I connect with the mills? And so I ended up uh, joining Upper Canada Fiber Shed and I sat, sat on their board for three years, uh, four years now. Um, and it really, you know, gave me a, a crash course on you know, understanding some of the issues that we have and, and some of the great opportunities we have in Canada. Um, but one of the problems we have, one of the challenges we have is just, um, unlike the United States, uh, we just don't have a lot of wool mills. And so when you have your yarn there, or you have your wool there, your fleece, um, you know, you can wait, if you go to one of our mills, you can wait anywhere from six months to a year in order for it to be processed. And that's difficult to, to have a business model around that. So, um, and part of the problem is electricity is really expensive in this country. Um, and we just, some of the, it's, it's, it's just challenging to get a mill up and running now. Um, so that's one of the hurdles we have. And then also just educating the public on, on wool, some of the benefits of wool, um, the fact that there's so many different breeds of, of sheep and um, some of it's very itchy, some of it's not itchy at all. 
And so it's just um, educating the, the public on that as well. Um, but you know, it's, it's, I found it very informative. Um, I've you know, working with Upper Canada Fiber Shed, they're, they're a great organization. Um, but you know, really my trip down this, this road in, with Cabin Boy Knits is, is fueled by passion. Um, and I, I don't think I'd be nearly as successful in this if, it, if I wasn't so passionate about it. Um, and it's just opened up so many doors for me. Um, and it, when I wake up in the morning or if I'm going for walks with, with my dog, um, I'm always thinking about, you know, what are the opportunities here? Um, what can I do with you know, um, various plants? Or, you know, how can I reach out to other people? How can I increase my network? Um, what am I gonna do for my next YouTube um, show? You know, all of those things, but it's always thinking about yarn in, in, in a very um, nice, like a, a very positive way. It's never a job for me. It's always enjoyment. So, um, you know, it's, 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 been, it's been fantastic. I think also the social media aspect of it has um, been very positive for me because it's allowed me to reach people all over the world. Um, you know, I was in, there was, I was at a wool show last year um, it's called Rhine, in Rhinebeck, New York. It's the New York um, Sheep and Wool Festival. And we were just walking through uh, the fairgrounds and same, someone came up to me and started talking to me about uh, an article that I had in Prince Edward County. And she was from Dubai. And so it's just, it was just so bizarre to, to hear the, the connection of how people, um, someone from Dubai um, who's you know, heard about the exhibit and um, is talking to me in person in New York. So I would say social media has definitely been um, a plus for me in helping me promote or, or get out the message that I, that I wanna get out to, to, to the world. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. A thousand questions, but I still have well, a call from our Susan or, or and, and Ann and Betty, did you want, and, and whoever is 416-656-0798, uh, I'm sure you show because Susan and Anne are both very much knitters, and uh, but I, I feel like we're meeting Merlin so. of the knitting world or something. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the crystal cave and the cave of wonders. Okay, so Susan and Anne, did you have a question? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh boy, where do we? Oh start? yeah, a thousand <laughs> questions. A thousand, where do you start? Oh my gosh. Okay. I love to see that you brought your knitting. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Um, I'm in the process of making these um, spiral socks. And oh, yeah. I'm using the Patton's Croy um, variegated wool. Yeah. And it's, it's turning out quite nice. But what I'm really wanting, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but there's some wool that you can buy so that when you knit it into socks, it looks like a feral pattern and you haven't actually done a feral pattern. You've just knit, you know, and, and I just wondered how to do that. Yeah, I, I, um, I think, yeah, do you know Artie and Carlos? They um, are knitting couple out of Norway and they have, um, they've a pri they have their name on a label um, and the, it's, it's very similar to the socks that you're talking about. And it's the dye process, it's the way it's dyed. You can't do that, it's computer generated. So you can't do that uh, from a natural dye perspective. It's, they're okay. able to, to program it and, um, do it that way through a computer. Can I add to the color piece? So, uh, when you mentioned all the the uh, the, the natural um, barks and trees and herbs that you used to dye, uh, uh, how did you? What, what was the journey from no knowledge to discovering <laughs> which which one uh, made um, uh, red and which one made yellow, and the list goes yeah. on. Yeah, it's it's really um, doing a lot of reading. Um, there's some great books out and there's some great Canadian books out on, on natural dyeing. Um, what I was really interested in was um, looking through the books and, and then going back in history because I wanted to know what we were doing, um, what, or what our ancestors were doing with respect to, to dyeing. You know, what did the indigenous people use for dyeing? Um, you know, what did the Europeans bring to the, to the uh, table with respect to dyeing? So it was really, uh, educating myself that way, but um, going to festivals and looking at yarn that had been hand dyed, looking at the color and figuring out um, you know, how best to, to, to get that color. Uh, but a lot of it's trial and error. 
and, and a lot of it is science. And there are so many variables that are come into play, which makes it fun for me um, in terms of impacting the color of your yarn. If you if the heat is too hot, you can destroy your batch. You can make it'll be a dull brown color, um, depending on if you're dying with flowers. Um, you know, if you're using basil, for example, the temperature can change your yarn from brown to um, to a blue to a brown. Um, it all depends on really the the color. I mean, uh, the temperature, but also, you know, in order to have your color bind to your yarn uh, mm -hmm. for natural dyeing, you have to have an agent. You have to have something that will al allow it to bind to the yarn. And so um, you can use alum, the same alum that you'd use in pickling. You can use acorns. You can use something with tannin in it because tannin will allow it to bind. You can use the pits from avocado to, oh, to help yeah. bind it as oh, well. Okay. So there's a lot of things that you can use. Um, and I will say that, you know, there is a, there's somewhat of a, I guess, a, a conflict between natural dyers and acid dyers. And, and it's, and, and I saw this, it was very apparent when I was in the US last year at the New York Wool and Sheep Festival, like three times when I mentioned to someone that I was a natural dyer, they just went on the attack and said, well, you, um, you know, you, your practice pollutes the environment and it's not very, and, and they were going on and on and telling me all, um, why all the bad things with natural dyeing. And I said, you know, natural dyeing can be harmful to the environment if you're using a mordant that is harmful to the environment. Um, I said, but that, that's, that's of yesteryear. We don't use those anymore. There's no need to use those. Mm -hmm. And if you were to actually go back further in history and look at our ancestors, they didn't use those either. So uh, I think there was, it was an opportunity for me to educate them on, on natural dyeing because there is a perception out there because of like natural dyeing in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, um, 70s, even the 80s, um, there were the chrome was used and, and other um, harmful metals. So, but I, I, I don't use any of those. And um, I think, John, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not, but. Well, you did, and I, I mean, I look at the colors behind you, and that that's remarkable. I, I think Thanks. Anne Anne has another question. Yeah, Anne. So I'm very curious as to, like, do you raise the sheep, shear the sheep, uh, oh. do the fleece, spin the yarn? Like, how I how wish. far do they go here? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I keep joking to my partner that I'll be. Uh, there'll be sheep in our backyard. Um, no, I don't I was do that. Say, I was going to say, when's that coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love that. Um, no, I work with farms. And so they do all the hard work. And um, and we also work with mills as well. And so what I, what I do is I will uh, reach out to a farm and ask if I can have, buy their um, yarn. And so... Um, we'll talk about how it's processed and whatnot, but I'll pro I will co-label the myself with the farm because I want to promote the farm too. I want people to know where the yarn comes from, and so oh, I've got a, actually an example of that right mm -hmm. here. Um, from sheep to from sheep to wool. <laughs> so this is so this is um, Twin Oaks Farm, mm -hmm. and and that's my label. And so what I did was um, I asked them for for yarn. And um, I paid them, we, we would get it at wholesale, uh, at a wholesale price, the price that they would normally get. Uh, but I bring them, I, I would sell these at basically at uh, festivals. And so they have their, I would leave, I like to leave one skein in a natural color and then I mm. dye the other one. Mm. So there's a little bit of both of us in this. And then I made uh, fingerless gloves out of this one. Mm. Um, and then, so this pattern will be sold in this kit along with, along with their knitting. And this was just another color that I used of theirs. It probably shows it a little better. Lovely. So it, partnership is, is really important, especially with Ontario farms. Have you ever read the book City uh, Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett? Yes. Oh yep. my goodness! I yep. know where you're going with this, JJ. Because you have the whole medieval tradition of shearing the sheep and selling the the, the wool and then dyeing it, and there was a whole communal connection. It was quite remarkable. Yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah. that's it. The other the other question I would have. So I, I think of your knitting. Now I, I, I'm a even though I'm not Scottish per se, I have a, a fish a fish affinity for all. I have two tartans at home and uh, Fraser and the other. But I think of the wool of a tartan, and that's woven, and 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 it's intricate of color. Have you have you ever in your research researched uh, the uh, the whole history of Scottish wool? And what led them to do what they do? Has that has that ever come across your pathway, or? Um, I would say, it, it has. Yes, um, I have it. It hasn't been a focus of mine, but it's definitely mm. been. I shouldn't say it hasn't been a primary focus. Yeah. It's definitely. I love Scotland. Right. Um, I'm of heritage, Scottish heritage as well, and um, I do have a. I am definitely connected to to Scotland. I'm interested in the sheep that they have, um, and the festivals that they have as well. But in terms of the history, you know, a lot we can't really understand our history unless we appreciate the history of, of Europe. And so, you know, if Scottish, our Scottish ancestors, English um, and Irish ancestors were um, fundamental in, and in, in, I can't forget France as well, mm -hmm. uh, but were fundamental in forming um, our knitting in Canada and what mm -hmm. Canadian knitting looks like. Even when you think about the couch and sweater, the famous couch and sweater from the West Coast and the Salish um, indigenous peoples, you know, they were um, phenomenal weavers and they, the Salish used to weave using um, hair from a dog and from um, goats and, and um, even um, the down from some, from birds. Um, they also had, one of the dogs that they had actually, the Salish Coast dog, um, has been is extinct now but um anyway they they were pr prolific weavers and then the europeans came and the europeans taught them how to feral knit and so what happened out of that came a a, a very specific style of knitting with the indigenous people um with the salish knitters and mm. and they um developed the couch and sweater which is now you know is protected by the canadian government um is, is in his canadian um icon so you know, it's, it's, there's definitely an influence there. So I guess that, you know, it's, it's, it's through that, but I haven't gone further. Um, I, I, I've gone, I would go, I'd say I've gone all the way to the beginning of where knitting came from, from nail binding mm -hmm. and how that evolved, but I haven't exclusively focused on Europe yet. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating. But I will. <laughs> and, and, and the arrangements of the, the skeins, I see that sort of a, in, a, in a typical fashion, but the, the braided, was that something you came up with or was that something you discovered or? Um, you mean like this or? Yes, yeah, one of those, yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've oh the exciting thing about this for me is that I've, I've, never, I've never seen this um, in a natural dye before. It was, I've seen these when an acid base, and when I talk about acid base versus natural, um, acid-based dyes are um, chemically created and um, you, know, you can squeeze them out and you can dye yarn. It's, it's much faster to dye yarn uh, mm. through acid-based process. So I'd never seen this before. And so I thought, you know what, why don't I try this with a natural dye? And so um, I came up with a process to, I figured out how to, how to do it and really happy with the result. Oh yeah, it's, it's amazing. Well, the earth tones are so rich looking. Thanks. It, yeah, part of, I know it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, part of that is um, when we talk about flowers or we talk about you know, the, the sumac, the berries on the stag su sumac or goldenrod, I pick them at their peak mm. and I use them at their peak. So there is a difference between using fresh and using dried. You can get great colors from each, but you can really get a vibrant color um, from the fr fresh botanicals. I mean, you could do a whole series just on going out in the field and Touching this and touching would be, be, be quite remarkable. Uh, yeah, but no, it's fun. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. So, and so I when when I think of it, there's a, there's a knitter that comes to mind whose name escapes me right now, and he's he's a, he's a male knitter, but he what he does with um, knitting he takes he'll take sometimes seven or eight colors, and he creates almost like a what weavers might do. He does that with knitting. And of course his name escapes me, but it's, it's, it's amazing uh, the, the, the visual that, that's created. Uh, but I'm probably being too vague. Does that ring a bell or? Oh yeah, he's the pilgrim knitter. He's the, okay. I think that's, he's known as, yeah. yeah. He's, he's fantastic. He does stained glass. It looks right. like stained glass. Right, right. And yeah, yeah he's, he's fantastic. 
Um, he, yeah, he's he's a, he's a great knitter. Uh, he lives in Toronto, right. and um, I think he's had his he's had a, even had a um, presentation at the Aga Khan Museum as well. Right. So he's yeah he's he's terrific. There's another woman I know, and about she was a, a double mastectomy survivor, and she has she calls it fiber pornography, and what she does she knits out of cotton. And essentially, they're, 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 they're well, breast implants uh, as, as, as a sort of an easier way for women as opposed to the rubber. Uh, does that ring a bell at all to you? Or? It does. Yep. Bar and Barold, and Barold Sang, her name is. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's actually, you know, that people have taken that and um, are doing that all over the world now. Um, and mm -hmm. so you, you'll go to festivals and there'll be a booth set up and um, asking people to donate or to take part or to help fund. Um, the creation of, of, of that. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's great. It's wonderful to see that it, how it spread. It's remarkable. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so Anne or Susan or, or Betty, do you have any questions? Uh, He's got to unmute. Yeah. There I unmuted. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Very good. So have you, ever had when you're dying like a total surprise where you you know are using a, a particular item to get a call and it turns out completely different but beautiful uh yes yeah absolutely <laughs> um i'm just looking now i saw i think i've sold out of one of the examples i wanted to share with you but um there was Goldenrod. So I, I, I dyed goldenrod, and it and it, the color is very predictable. It's going to be a yellow. Um, it's going to be a nice an, a nice yellow, but I a, a, a beautiful yellow. But I over dyed. I, I took indigo, and the indigo the indigo dye process is completely different than regular natural dyeing. So I took my goldenrod dyed yarn and put it in the indigo, and it came out an electric green color. Mm. And you just look at it and think. How is that possible? Like, how, how is it possible to get? The, and it reminded me of if you look at the little bugs that have some of them yeah, like they're yeah. dressing green. Yes. That's just what it looked like. So, and it was unbelievable. I couldn't. I was. I was really, really. I was pleasantly surprised. And then the other one is um, along similar lines: is the leaves of rhubarb. If you're mm. if you're dying with rhubarb leaves, um, you can get if you're using alum as a mordant, you can get an electric green color as well. Really? Wow. wow. Isn't that something? We just assume that electric green is artificial, but obviously not. Well, I mean, there are, as you say, there are many insects that are electric green and there are many flowers that are of electric green and electric. I mean, some of the colors of, of uh, dahlias and other, are, are remarkable how bright they are. Wow. Now, Edna's joined the call. She's 95 and she'll, knit, she'll make 200 hats at, <laughs> at a moment's notice. Oh, did That's she disappear? Awesome. She disappeared on me. Oh, well, I guess she, she heard her name and ran out the door. But uh, <laughs> she still drives, too, and she owns her own condo, lives alone. And I said, That's that, amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, it is. It is. Great. Now, Betty, do you have a question? Uh, no, I'm actually not a knitter, but I'm finding this very interesting. My oh, sister. it is. Yeah. yeah. She's busy Betty, knitting. It's never too late to pick uh, it up. Yeah. <laughs> She's in England. I just had a nice pair of socks from her. <laughs> I remember trying crocheting. I've never actually tried knitting. I did macrame proficiently when it was in vogue many years ago, but certainly knitting would be something I might ponder. But uh, when, when COVID, when we sort of go back to a bit more opening, I would really love to visit your, your, your shop. I, lo I love your, oh, yeah. the, the, 1850, the 1850 cabin. And I, I lived in uh, Mono Mills for five years. And so there was a lot of people who went back to the land with herbs and other and culinary and medicinal and because all those herbs you're talking about probably have uh, healing qualities as well. I'm sure they do. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I've got instructional videos on YouTube, and I talk. I like to cover three things. On I, I, I always want to cover the history of the plant and how it was used, and then I'll get into the medicinal mm -hmm. um, aspects of it, and then the the reason why people are there to to show how to die with that with that particular mm -hmm. uh, plant. So I find all your dying stories are very, very interesting. One thing, though, that I would like to know, um, I've knit, crocheted just about everything you possibly can. However, 
there are certain things I kind of avoid because they just look too complex. So I'm just wondering if, if in your all your knitting that you've done, you've seen a pattern and thought, oh my gosh, that's really difficult. But then it turns out that it's not really all that difficult after all. And, and if you have something like that, just let me know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, it, especially when I was first starting out looking at patterns and thinking, oh my gosh, how could I pause? How do you possibly tackle that? And I think, you know, the, one thing that I had to, that I, that I did quickly was um, when I'm frogging, frogging is when you're taking, when you mess something up and you have to start over again or take it out. To me, I was, I would look at that as you're learning. So I was, and, and because I changed and, and started viewing knitting like that, it allowed me to make mistakes. I didn't get frustrated when I made mistakes. So when I started chipping away at some of the patterns, um, you know, I would do it. And yeah, I do get frustrated if I think that the pattern doesn't make sense, or I just don't understand where they got to, but thank goodness for YouTube. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there that can help explain <laughs> these things, but it was my mindset of changing it from, you know, this is not a big deal. Um, you know, it's just a piece of yarn. <laughs> it's, 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 you can just, do it over again, and, and and that's practice. And so I chipped away at that. You know, I was teaching a brioche class um, in Quebec two years ago, and that is um, a type of knitting that a lot of people have difficulty with. And so I went into the class thinking it was three hours, we or two hours, and we're only going to learn six rows. Six. You only have to learn six rows, and it's. I guess it was just. It's just the way people brioche is is, is a different, a little bit different way of thinking. And a lot of people had uh, struggled with that. So I, I could see people, you know, not wanting to, to gravitate to our brioche, but brioche is one that's very rewarding. And once you figure out the six rows, you're laughing. Like you've, it's, you've, you've. To, 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 to not, not even a novice, a person on the edge. What is, what is brioche? It's, it's just a different style of knitting. Um, okay. and yeah, it's, it's, it's just, just a different style. Okay. okay. So is it just based on a, a pattern set, like six, a six row pattern? Yes. Yep. Yep. And, and it looks, it... it actually, brioche looks very similar to this. Um, it looks very similar. Oh, I like that. Yeah. It's oh, okay. But even stylistically, that looks quite interesting. Yeah, I would say. Quite but remarkable. it's it's very rewarding once you master it and it opens up a, a complete world to you because it's, it's, it's um, you don't have a bad side. It's, it's great on, it's great on other sides. So oh, if the, okay. Okay. if the yellow is dominant on this side, the brown will be dominant on the other side when you when you turn it inside out. I think I, I found the same thing when I discovered Tunisian crochet. Oh, yes. And all of a sudden, I'm making crocheted items that look more like knitted items, and it does, it's not as holy. It's you know more solid. Yeah. Um, that opened up a lot of new patterns for me once I figured that one out. That's on my bucket list. I have. That's, that's Vene Venetian crochet? Tunisian. Tunisian Vene oh, crochet. Tunisian. Okay. Right. So oh. it's the one, JJ, you yes. know the last comfort shawl I made for Fina? Right. That was Tunisian crochet that I used okay. for that. Okay. Oh, fascinating. So what we're talking about comfort shawls, but they were called prayer shawls. So if someone has uh, a need of, of, of comfort of the community, we make them for them. We, we ask a blessing upon them. And, and then do that. That's a way to connect. Yeah, I actually had that on my list of things to bring up today because I, I, I noticed on your website that you have a section talking about uh, the prayer shawl or the comfort shawl. And um, my mother had ALS. Right. Um, she passed away six years ago okay. and she received a, a prayer shawl um, from a church um, that her sister was affiliated with. And it, you know, it was, it's a big deal. It, it really, I know she really appreciated it. We all appreciated it. It was wonderful. So, so it's great work that you're, that you're doing. I find it's it's a really um, nice way to give people that need a hug a hug yeah. of a comfort shawl when you can't give them a real hug because of COVID. You know, so it's it's particularly uh, wonderful this year. Yeah, that's a fantastic way of looking at it. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Because everyone needs a hug one way or the other. Yeah. So do, do so. Anyone else have a question? And I, I think this is something we probably uh, we'll, we'll probably have a million either ideas. Well, when it gets warmer, it might be seat like grid risky or outdoors <laughs> and see what's <laughs> going on there. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. 
I mean, they're quite remarkable. Now, are there any uh, wool festivals near you? Or are you starting a wool festival yourself? Or? Um, there are. I would love to start one myself. I, 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 it's actually, I've, I've been thinking about it, but there are a number of them. One of them is in Prince Edward County. And it's usually in, I think it's in May. Uh, it's in the early part of the year. I think it's at the end of May. Um, and they're three years old now. Um, and they're getting quite a, a nice group. Um, in Toronto, there is the Toronto Knitters Guild puts on one every year. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be canceled again for 2021. Um, and that's a, that's great. When there's also Land Made, which happens in February in Toronto at the Gladstone, um, and that is yarn um, that is there's there's very strict guidelines on what it can be. It's really to promote farm sheep farm farmers and their yarn. Um, so it's a, a lot of, if anything's dyed, it's naturally dyed, uh, but you get a lot of great different types of fiber there. So. so one mini question I would have before. So you talk about sheep wool. Now, yeah. when, when, when one takes goat, because obviously goat, there's a, is a color code is called mo, not mohair. Um, yeah, mohair. Do you also, have you ever, um, is that cashmere? Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, mohair is the something else. Oh, we cashmere. Do you ever explore that, or is that a whole other universe? And we'll we'll keep that over in, in left field. Right? Oh no no, it's 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 nice yeah. because it's nice to mix um, yeah. high quality fiber with. You can mix high quality fiber with fiber that is a little rougher around the edges, right. and right. give it a unique blend. It also picks up dye differently. Right. Um, uh, alpaca will pick up dye differently than merino wool. Um, you know, a lot of merino wool is called superwash, and superwash really allows you to put your knitted garment in the washing machine. Oh, and, okay. And wash it that way. And you say what merino, it does is, is merino from a goat? Merino is, is sheep from Australia. Oh, okay. Um, and okay. it's considered okay. the, the, the best, one of the best um, yarn out there because it's soft. The, it's soft to the touch. You can mm -hmm. wear it directly on your skin. Um, it keeps me warm when I'm skiing. Yes. Yeah. So you'll often see times if, if it's made of wool and if, if it's made of merino, it will say on the label that's made of, because that's a good thing. I mean, it's a positive right. that it's that oh, is made sure. of merino. Wonderful. Well, listen, Christopher, thank you. And thank you. You've been, again, I see you, a merling of the knitting world, definitely, in, in, <laughs> in, a, in a remarkable way. And uh, anyone else, any sort of closing questions or thoughts or? No? Okay. Well, Thank you again, and uh, keep, yeah. keep, keep posting on Instagram. I really love you. I will. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thanks everyone for your questions. I really appreciate it. Thank well, you. Thanks for coming and joining us. We yes. really love hearing about textiles and yarn in particular. <laughs> yes. My pleasure. Well, have a great okay. day. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thank Take you. care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay.